Roll Tide and welcome to Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR. I'm Roger Hoover. Now, please be joined by the Director of Athletics for the University of Alabama, Greg Byrne, as we're coming to you live from the Advantage Center here inside Bryant-Denny Stadium. And Greg, I've loved our Zoom interviews over the last few years, going back to the COVID days, but it's nice to see you in person. Roll yeah, Tide. Yeah, it absolutely. I obviously, I've toured the Advantage Center, been around here for quite a bit, but my podcast debut <laughs> here, so it's good to be here to see where all you know how this all works. Yeah, it's been great so far getting to interact with student athletes athletes getting to hear their stories about how they came to Alabama and now what's ahead for them with the Crimson Tide. And it's a great time to catch up with you as uh, we're nearing the end of June. Uh, the last time that Alabama competed, it went very well in Eugene, Oregon, as spring sports came to a close. You had to be thrilled with the success. First of all, we'll start with the track and field team. Yeah, another incredible showing by uh, our track our track teams. Uh, the women finished seventh, the men finished fourth. We went to the four by 400 at the last race on the men's side um, and had, had a tough performance, but if we would have won that race, we would have won our first ever track championship in, in, in men's track and field here in our history. Uh, we've had a lot of individual national champions, had another one in Doris, and she won the 3,000 uh, meter steep, steeplechase. Uh, I was able to be there for that event, which was great. And, uh, you know, it's just, the, the, I, I know our fans know this, but in, until you're around it on a daily basis, how much time and effort and energy all of our kids put in, no matter the sport. Um, you know, when they get to see those type of accomplishments, it's really special. And, and uh, you know, as, as the AD to be there, it means a lot to me uh, to, to, to witness them. And every once in a while you hear it from the kids too that, hey, they, they appreciate you taking the time to be there. That was really great to see another national championship with Doris, like you mentioned, and that comes off the heels of Philip Planishek with he, what he was able to do in tennis. What a remarkable run he had, beating some great players and hoisting a national championship trophy of his own. Yeah, that that was really special to to see what Philip did, and and obviously in our spring sports, we we had continued to have another good solid season. We'll, I know we'll talk about some of the other ones, but to have Philip win the national championship that was cool, and you hate it. Because you try to schedule yourself to where you can be at different things, but and I could not get to Oklahoma City that day. Uh, but we were watching first time I'd ever watched tennis online. I've, I usually just follow it on 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 the apps and such. But uh, I I made sure I was in front of my computer to watch it. And what an incredible accomplishment! I'm really proud of proud of Philip. Really appreciate the the job that George did as coaching him and supporting him and. And it was great to see for our program. It really was. And it came at the same time the softball team was in Knoxville taking on Tennessee in that super regional. Patrick Murphy goes on the ESPN broadcast, and he doesn't even talk about softball. He's yes. talking about Phillip. Was this one of the more connected years you've seen between all sports? We've heard about Coach Murphy's impact on the men's basketball team and some other sports on campus. But just even going to our different events, the connection has been so good between our student athletes and coaches from all over. Yeah, and, and Murph's one of the best at it. And just being there and paying attention to all of our sports sports and uh you know it, for the first time i had him address our entire department and and when we had our all we do two all staff meetings a year one in the fall one in the spring and uh, we did our april one and and uh, i called him i said you know they don't need to hear from me this time I, although i still spoke but i said i'd love them to hear about mudita and uh, talk about the you know that whole experience and why why you got behind that and the experience of that that creates within your program to where the young women in the softball program have genuine joy and, and celebration when somebody else on the team uh, does well. And I said, that's, I, I love that attitude, and, and we try to have that for all of our sports. Every head, head coaches meeting we have, which we go almost monthly, um, I get up there and I talk about every team in there, what they're doing, accomplishments. If I'm not, if I don't have a lot to say, that means that we haven't done very well in that sport. And so I've, I've had coaches tell me before, man, I, I, I want to be talked about in front of all my peers because something that we're doing really well. And, um, uh, and so Murph, Murph's always done such a good job of celebrating other people's success and, and, uh, you know, getting to go to Oklahoma city again, that's something we cannot take for granted. And uh, it was a bit of an upset, as we knew, to get there this year. Uh, but the kids came together. Coach Murphy, Coach Murphy and, the, and the staff did a wonderful job of leading them and, uh, and obviously uh, trying to address a few things this, during this offseason, but very excited about uh, what's ahead for our softball program, too. How about all the parallels we saw between the softball team having that run to the Women's College World Series, the men's team, everyone was counting them out before they go on that great run in the NCAA tournament, football as well. After mm -hmm. a rocky first few weeks of the season, you get all the way to the SEC championship and a Rose Bowl appearance. Yeah. That's why you play the whole season, right? Yeah. Uh, you, if, you, if you decide that after one game or two games, that that's what just the, 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 
the painting is going to be at the end for the season. That's not that's not fair to those kids. It's not fair to the coach. It's not fair to our fans who are there all the time. And uh, and so I think both men's basketball and and softball this year, especially. I'm sure there's other examples I can give. Um, the resiliency they showed to maximize the ability that they had. Uh, and, and yeah, football's a great example, right? After the South Florida game, you know, we were all scratching our heads a little bit, uh, concerned, but you got Nick Saban leading it. Uh, he, he was going to keep working at it every day, and that and that's within, you know, that's the culture within the program. So uh, good things happen. Just stay resilient and stay on top of it and deal with adversity the best that you can, and you'll, you'll have them the best – outcomes that you can possibly have if you if you continue to to not take your foot off the gas really great to see that again for the softball team that great run to the women's college world series uh the baseball team had a lot of great home victories this right. year a season ticket sales are through the roof for sewell thomas stadium uh what do you make of year one of the rob vaughn era yeah really proud of rob he, he took over a challenging situation as we know uh, jj obviously was was really important in that process as were some other folks um he kind of calmed the waters and did a really good job culturally. I, you know, I, I, I make sure I say hello to parents, but I, you know, I, I don't spend a ton of time with parents because obviously all the kids, all our coaches, our staff, our fans, everything. But in some of the interactions I had with the parents on the team, it was very positive about just where the program is right now. Obviously, it didn't go as well down in Tallahassee as we wanted it to, uh, but uh, feel very confident they're out there working hard and recruiting, doing our, our you know, putting our in, in this trend. Uh, transfer portal world uh, doing a good job of holding on to some key kids and then at the same time trying to bring in a couple I'm, I think I'm meeting with a baseball recruit on Sunday so um, you know they, they're working at it very hard to make sure you know get back to the regionals hopefully make another super regional make that run to Omaha and it's it's tough in the SEC you know we're seeing A&M and who we who we uh, let's see Tennessee we got two or three yep. only then, team to beat them in a series yeah yep. and then A&M <laughs> One, one the final three, game, one yeah. Three. That's I mean, right. I was trying to remember what Saturday like crazy. was. And Matt Cassetti had yeah. two grand slams That's in the series. Exactly. Like we had some good moments. <laughs> we held it all in for Sunday, <laughs> didn't we? Right. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you can see what I mean, it, it, the College World Series is filled completely this year with SEC and ACC teams. Um, it's 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 big boy baseball that we're playing every week, but we want to be a part of it, and, and we'll continue to get better. As we continue working backwards a little bit from this spring, uh, the last time you and I spoke, we're all preparations for A Day and Kalen DeBoer's uh, first appearance at A Day, uh, Coach Saban at Denny Chimes getting to honor the captains, and then we saw the fan response. I mean, the Walk of Champions felt so energetic uh, going into the stadium. Obviously, a great crowd there. Just what'd you make of A Day? Yeah, it shows you the passion of the University of Alabama. How much people genuinely care about it, and and uh, I, I think we said 73, 74,000 was the announced attendance. And you know, it was it was good. It was a great turnout. And I, and I told Coach DeBoer, I said, it's going to be a little different than what you're used to from a spring game standpoint. And, you know, one of the really incredible things in this transition, Coach Saban has been, and Miss Terry too, they both have been so supportive. And, and at the same time too, Coach DeBoer and his wife Nicole have embraced them as well. And that's healthy for everybody involved is healthy for our program. That sends the right message out there to the college football world, the high school football world. Uh, you can see that, that Coach DeBoer and his staff are doing a nice job in recruiting. Uh, we've got official visitors in starting tonight. I'll be, me I'll be meeting with them tomorrow morning at breakfast. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, um, I, I, it's, it's good to see that energy continue, and that's critical. And as you can imagine, we, we spent a lot of time and energy focused on what – when that time came for Coach Saban, uh, what gives us the best opportunity to have success in the transition? And we won't be perfect. We'll make mistakes in that and through it. But uh, but I want our fans to know that we we spent a lot of time trying to prepare for that, and we couldn't ask for for better um, partnership support that both Coach Dave and Miss Terry, the DeBoers, and then everybody around it have been doing just to work through this together, and and that gives us the best chance for long term success. Sticking with football for just a moment, what's going to be most important for you and your staff, first of all, for the fan experience coming up this fall mm -hmm. at Bryant-Denny Stadium, and then just, again, continuing to help out Coach DeBoer and his new staff get ready for their first fall camp and then kick it off against well, Western Kentucky? We got a lot of questions about it, so I'll address it. I think the field will be in good shape. Not I think. I know it will be. Um, we, uh, uh, which, you know, obviously the spring game didn't go as well as we wanted on that, as far as that part goes. Um, but, you know, it's just a new day, right? And uh, we're going to make sure we respect our tradition. And at the same time, things will continue to evolve. 
um, we, you know, one of the things I thought was pretty, pretty funny is, um, you know, coach DeBoer plays music out of practice and he's, he's done that, I think for quite a while, a lot of programs do coach Saban chose not to, he had every right not to play music. Right. And, and so you'll, you'll continue to see little tweaks of what takes place and how things are approached. And as long as we keep true to who we are at the university of Alabama through that, um, I think our fans will be very pleased. We're going to continue to work on our, our, our customer service. Um, you know, I, I was really pleased to see that our first two games, or actually our first three home games are all going to be evening kicks, which will be nice from a, from a weather standpoint and heat standpoint. You know, knock on wood that we don't get storms. Um, but, uh, you know, th- that'll be good from a fan experience standpoint. It's easier to support our fan base on a game day at a night game for the most part, because especially early on in the year. Um, just because you're not dealing with the heat-related issues as much, but you know, if we if we get into a mid-October game when we're playing during the day, we'll do everything we can to make sure we're supporting our fans across the board. How nice is it to have so many of these game times already laid out, or we know it'll be the flex, either an afternoon or a later kick. It's great. I think Greg Sankey and and the SEC office and and uh, our partners from ESPN they deserve a lot of credit. We, we as ads have been pushing to have more knowledge of game days on the front end. So our fans can play in. There's a big difference on a on a 11 a.m. Central game and a, and a six o'clock and how a family's going to plan to get here and be a part of it and tailgate and everything else, go home that night, all those things. And so giving us that flexibility and knowing that hey, we know we know some games are going to be night games for sure. We know some are going to be in this three four hour window. That helps our fans a lot. We think that's great. It really does. So again, we're excited for football season that's just around the corner. And then uh, a lot of fans, I think I've talked more about men's basketball specifically in the month of June than I ever have before on some of these shows because obviously the run to the Final Four was so memorable. We've continued to see good news coming out uh, from Nate Oates in this basketball program. Uh, just as you look back to when the run started in the NCAA tournaments where it ultimately ended up uh, in Arizona for the Final Four, how special was that three-week stretch for this it, program? It was, it was incredible. Um, Nate, uh, from the time we touched down here in Tuscaloosa, uh, the energy that he brings to that program day in and day out. And uh, you've seen it in the roster turnover world we're in right now. Um, he, has, he doesn't sit and complain about it. He just goes and goes to work. And uh, kids see that positive energy. They see that just the, the culture of the program. And they want to be a part of it. I actually got to watch, watch uh, some workouts yesterday for the first time with the new, new group. Um, I certainly don't have the eye that Nate Oates has, but I know a little bit. And uh, uh, we're going to have a good basketball team, men's basketball team this year. I think we're going to have a good women's team too. Uh, Coach Curry's done a good job uh, bringing a couple key pieces in. And uh, then obviously we had the exciting news of, of announcing the new practice facility. People have said it's a renovation of Coleman. It's really not a renovation of Coleman other than uh, some team areas that we're going to work on inside of Coleman. But it's, it's the day-to-day practice. The women are going to take over the current men's gym and then connected to that side, that uh, southeast side of Coleman Coliseum will be a whole new building that's going to have a new court for the men. Uh, It will be connected to, it will be right next door to where the women will go as well. And then they're all going to have new team rooms, locker rooms, um, uh, video rooms, and the coaches' offices, both for the men's and women's. Part of the women's will be on the existing um, there's a platform overlooking the court. Some of the women's offices will be built into that. Um, and, and you know, we, we've talked about the arena much longer than I've ever wanted to talk about it, um, but our world's changed, and we, we've had to continue to adapt. As you can see, uh, kids pay a lot more attention, the coaches pay a lot more attention to where they're going to spend 95% of their time, which is their practice facility and, and their meeting rooms and everything around it. So we're going to have a really, really good setup for, bo- for both of our programs, it shows our commitment to wanting to be successful bo- with both of our basketball programs. And there's a lot of momentum for that. And so maybe it's not quite the arena that we're taking advantage of it to that level, but we're showing a very significant step that will put us on par with anybody in the country from a day-to-day development standpoint. And Coleman still is going to have to be addressed. You know, it's it's older than I am, and I got a lot of gray hair, right? And so... Um, at some point, we're going to have to address this, but this gives us a little bit of time to figure out what our new model in college athletics is going to look like as we're navigating the ha- the house litigation settlement and the impact that we'll have. I'd encourage our fans, um, for those who are watching this, go go do a Google search on on house house litigation 
uh, and you can read some of the articles that are out there. I'm not saying all of them are the gospel, so to speak, uh, but it'll give you some context to what we're dealing with, and it's very significant. It's gonna, it's going to have an impact on what we're doing, no matter where you are in college sports. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I think even fans that try to keep up with so much of the off the field news as much as they can probably are getting lost a little bit with everything mm-hmm. that's come out in the last few months. Uh, it, it certainly has changed a lot, and the future can seem very uncertain for a lot of fans. So, kind of, what's the most? Where's your focus going to be as you try to navigate these waters? That you know, we can even talk about five years down the road. We don't know what it'll look like, but even next year, and just yeah. all these different terms that are thrown out, I think it could be a little overwhelming. Yeah, it is. Um... I was I was actually talking to Jay Sewell, our men's golf coach, the other the other day, and uh, I know we'll get to that in a second. But uh, uh, Jay was talking to one of his peers, another coach, another prominent program, and he, he they were out there out this time of year recruiting. Right, Jay was in Chicago last week recruiting, and uh, one of the coaches said, "Man, I, I didn't understand this house litigation." He said, "Well, my I'm not doing this as this. It's just you got to be up front. You got to tell people what's going on," and. Uh, Jay said, "Well, Greg's been talking to us about it for about a year. That this is this is this is a big deal, and uh, we had an all staff meeting in in April, like I mentioned. I I talked to him about the house litigation, and that we're going to have to have a different lens on how we do our day to day operations. Um, and and so there's going to be some good with that. There's going to be some challenge with that. And everybody, not just Alabama, everybody will be dealing with this going forward. Um, so." What I what I would say to our fans is is, is take the time to learn about it. Uh, it's 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 complicated. Uh, we're gonna we're there's been a settlement that has um, uh, is in the process of trying to be finalized sometime after the first of the year, most likely, and uh, that that will give us some guidelines as far as what you know how this will be structured going forward. Uh, there will be um, there will be it will be a different model that may have an impact on on collectives. On, on, you know, yay Alabama and everybody else. I've seen the, the uh, collective start to organize and try to say, hey, we're, we need to be here afterwards. They may be. They may not be. We don't know. Anybody that's coming out and saying this is how we're going to handle it exactly in a lot of different facets, whether it's, whether it's collectives, whether it's Title IX, whether it's, you know, um, any of the other thing, buzzwords that you see out there. We, we don't know yet. We don't need to, we don't need to come out and say, this is the way it's absolutely going to be. Cause, cause until the courts give us some direction, um, you know, I think it's any, it's, it's anybody's guess of where we may end up. Yeah. And there's certainly so much change going on already with the Southeast but, Conference. Yeah, Go let, ahead. Me, let me jump. But yeah. with that, we're not just sitting here saying, Oh, I guess we'll wait to see what happens. We're, we have spent a lot of time already over the last year preparing for different scenarios and what, what that, what that will be. And it's important that we are prepared when the, when it comes, when the time comes and, and I hope our fan base feels like, Hey, you know, that one of the things we try to do is, is think about different significant things that will impact our department and, and try to be as prepared as we possibly can be knowing that we won't always have the answers in advance, but when, when it comes time to making decisions that were, that, that they're well thought out, that they're, they're, we're thinking about our student athletes. We're thinking about our university. We're thinking about our athletic department. We're thinking about our fan base and how those impact all those different areas. One of the changes we have talked about before when it was announced a few years ago, the addition of the SEC expanding, uh, going to Texas and Oklahoma, joining the league. And now July 1, they are members. I know at SEC spring meetings, uh, you get to see your colleagues from those schools. Uh, just how excited are you now to expand the SEC, as Greg Sankey has talked about before, in a way that makes sense? Yeah, w- w- there's a lot of positives with uh, adding Texas and Oklahoma. They fit with us. They fit culturally. The other thing it does is – I. It, it makes sense from a geographic standpoint too. Um, you know, the, our, we're, we're really centrally located. We can still bus to a number of schools from here, right? One of the things I think that made the SEC championship football game so special over the years, besides just the historical um, success of the SEC, how much it's a part of our culture, you could drive to Atlanta in five hours from almost every school, right? And that made sense. We're, we're fortunate. We're about as centrally located as anybody in the SEC. Um, Adding Texas and Oklahoma doesn't disrupt that. We're not having to fly all the way out to the West Coast or far up to the Northeast. The furthest north we go is Kentucky. And uh, I think geographically, if you look at a map, I think it's still Kentucky, not, right. not, not Columbia, <laughs> Missouri. Um, but, uh, you know, that made sense for us. 
they they take their athletics seriously just like we do. And uh, you know, sometimes when college athletics is criticized, and and listen, there's not a perfect entity out there, organization out there anywhere. Um, but we we what. We're proud that we are in big-time college sports. We want to be part of big-time college sports. We think that it gives a tremendous stage to the young people in our program, lets them develop them to the maximum of their God-given abilities. Um, it brings the community together. It highlights your university. It, it, there's so many positives of college sports. And, um, and so, you know, I, for one, think we should talk about that more. We should be proud of who we are at the University of Alabama. We, we have... We, we have had such great history. We're, we are having success at really high levels today. I think we're going to finish ninth or 10th in the Director's Cup, which will probably be our high, second highest finish ever, which is the overall performance of the athletic department. Um, and and our, our kids are really doing an incredible job of representing this university. And, uh, and that's, that's worth talking about, and that's worth celebrating. And, and all of us as, as our fans – we should we should be uh, we should be celebrating together with that because it takes all of us, you know. In spite of the leadership in athletics, in my role, we're having success, um, but it's but it takes all of us to be as good as we possibly can be. And I don't think there's a better school out there than the University of Alabama, of all working together to have that success. And that's from Dr. Bell. That's our trustees. That's that's our coaches that we have. We have got a great lineup of coaches, but it's the passion of our of our fans, and it's the passion, and the hard work of our kids too. That's really good to see. And uh, sticking with Texas and Oklahoma for a moment, we've heard about your friendships within uh, SEC ADs. Uh, how about uh, Joe Castiglione, Chris Del Conte, now being your colleagues in the same conference? Yeah, I, I, I met I met Joe Castiglione. He had he was like thirty five years old. and He had just become the AD at Missouri, and I was a uh, this was at the uh, Orange Bowl between Nebraska, Tommy Frazier's I think junior year, and uh, and Florida State. Uh, and Bobby Bowden was coaching Osborne. My dad was AD at Nebraska, and I met uh, Joe. He had just like been named the AD the day before. I think I was a sophomore in college, if I'm not mistaken, so a long time ago. And and he's been a just a one that he's been an AD as long as he has. Uh, I think he's he's over 30 years now. That's hard to do. I'm I'm in year 17 or 18. And and uh, side story, I'm really good at this. The other day I was on a Zoom. Uh, with the eight, the president of the Atlanta Falcons, uh, ads from about four or five different schools, they were talking about some stuff with with Mercedes Benz Dome and all that, and uh, uh, so that I wasn't leading the meeting, and the ad that was said, "Well, Greg, as the as the senior member of this uh, call, what is your opinion? You want, we want you to speak first. I'm like, God dang, man, I I, won't, I was 36 when I became the ad at Mississippi State, and. Uh, uh, I, I've always kind of thought of myself as the young guy, and uh, I guess I'm the only one that thinks that now. Uh, but Del Conte at, at Texas, we go way back. Uh, you know, I love to give him a hard time, and he gives me a hard time too. We've been dear friends for a long, long, long time. First time I ever met him, I tell the story. It was 1995. Um, I was the regional fundraiser at Oregon, making $25,000 a year. Regina was pregnant with Nicholas, who's 28, who will be 29 next month. And um, so I'm in the exhibit hall at NACTA, which is our national conference. And I'm uh, eating the free hors d'oeuvres and drinking the free, I think I had a beer in there and, and drink, drinking the free beverages that they had. And, uh, and I'm standing next, because that's all I could afford. I couldn't afford to go out to dinner. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I'm standing next to this guy and he is talking, he's talking, he's talking. And I finally said, who, who are you? He said, I'm Chris Del Conte from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He was their like facilities and external guy at Cal oh, Poly. Wow. And we ended up going to a Riddick bow fight that night. And we've been friends for 30, almost next year will be 30 years since then. And, uh, and he's at AD at Texas and I'm the AD at Alabama. So we're both very fortunate. So you never, it's a, it's a great lesson. You know, the relationships that you build, uh, some of not all of them are going to be lifelong. Right. But, you know, it's important to have those types of friendships and relationships and, and being there for each other when things are good and being there for each other when times are challenging too. Now I want to beat the tar out of them oh, yeah. and everything that we do. And they're a heck of a program, both at Oklahoma and, and Texas. Uh, but it's okay to have collegiality uh, when you're not going 
to compete with one another and uh, and have some friendships too. Yeah, maybe we'll see Texas in the SEC championship game. We know we're going to Norman uh, right before uh, the Iron Bowl, so we're certainly looking forward to that trip. <laughs> That's right, absolutely. I've, I've never been to Norman for a football game, so I'm looking forward to it. That'll certainly be good. Uh, you mentioned a moment ago the men's golf team, uh, great success stories this year, uh, starting with Nick Dunlap, the U.S. Amateur win, winning on the PGA Tour, and then uh, turning professional, having a great year. And now the future Nick Dunlaps are going to have such a great home along with the women's golf team. Yeah. You have to be thrilled with the progress the golf facility is making. Yeah, it's it's last Friday night, uh, uh, Jay Sewell and his wife Stephanie uh, took Regina and I out for a tour because uh, I hadn't been there for about a month and a half. And it, it's awesome, man. It's really cool. And we've had some donors really step up to make this thing a reality. It's going to be really special, really unique. Our kids are going to be able to have access as long as the sun's up, right? And, they'll, and heck, they can be in the hitting bays when the sun's down. And uh, it's, it shows a tremendous commitment to our golf programs. Uh, we want to be great there. We have donor support that allows it to happen. That We have specific donors who are really interested in seeing uh, the success we've had in the past and, and even to today uh, even take a whole other step up. And uh, it's going to be hard to duplicate for anybody. I'm not saying it can't happen, but a mile from campus, uh, some of the best golf facilities out there are 20 miles from campus. Uh, so it's going to be incredible. We're going to be able to qualify out there. You're going to be able to play the holes multiple different ways, and uh, and the clubhouse and the practice area. Um, you know, the story I like to tell is when I just showed the concept to Justin Thomas the first time. Um, I, we, he and I did a Zoom together, and I and I was walking him through it, and I got done, and I said, "What do you think, JT?" And he said, "That may be the coolest golf concept I've ever seen. First recruit I ever showed it to." Nick Dunlap. How about that? Yeah, because he was kind of <laughs> waffling there at the end. Other schools were using our facility against us. And um, and so Jay called me. He said, hey, uh, we got this kid named Nick Dunlap coming in. And uh, he said he needs to see the facility if you don't mind. I said, yeah, absolutely. We'll show it to him. And, and uh, he signed the next day. How much do you enjoy those interactions with recruits, even if they maybe don't even sign with Alabama, but you follow their career elsewhere? And obviously right. you love the guys that do and guys and girls that do sign here, but just is that one of the best parts of your job? Love it. Met with a track recruit right before I came over here. I tell our coaches, don't have me meet with a recruit to appease me. Have me meet with a recruit if you think it helps. Okay. And and uh you can you can tell the story of who we are from my lens. And we won't Um, you know, Regina and I uh, had moved, or move, and we we were we were in a temporary home for about a year and a half. We're moving back uh, to a home that we can have all the teams over, and we have 650 18 to 22 year olds. I can't know them all as, as, as you know as an individual as much as I want, but they know by you being there, they know they know that you care. Okay, listen, I, I I'm in the weight room in the morning. You probably can't tell, but. I'm there, be, obviously, to take care of myself, but I'm there to be around the, the young men and young women in our program. A little bit at a time. You don't come on too strong, just a little bit at a time, and you build the relationships. And it's sometimes you don't know that they're watching, and that they're paying attention. But it's amazing. Oftentimes, toward the end of their career or after they're done, you hear the stories of things you didn't even know. And, and that goes for all of us. All of us have an opportunity to make impacts on the people's lives we're in. Every one of us, every single day. And I tell our staff that you all, you all, we all have an opportunity to serve. And when we serve other people and we think about their feelings, their emotions, how they're doing over ours, we're happier with who we are. And I fall short of that at times, but it's amazing when I do, when I don't, when I take it off of me, myself, and I, and try to talk about we, us collectively, I'm a better AD, I'm a better father, I'm a better husband. Uh, I'm a better friend. And again, at times I fall short there. I don't do as good a job as I should. But if I can keep getting back to that on a regular basis, uh, I'm going to be better at all those different areas. And we all, each of us have that opportunity on a daily, on a daily basis to make an impact. It could be one person. Okay. It could be tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. It doesn't matter. You know, everybody wants to feel valued. And even if we're only making an impact on one person, that one person appreciates the, the steps and actions that you took. That's really well said. As we wrap things up, uh, we mentioned there's a lot going on in the college sports landscape. Uh, what's most important for you over these next few weeks before we talk again? Probably, hopefully, sometime in August. <laughs> I'm going to try to recharge my battery a little bit. I'm, I'm going to try to take 10 days where I don't have any contact and, and check out and recharge. Actually, Coach Saban talked to me about the importance of July and, uh, and, and 
getting ready because it is it's seven days a week for 11 months of the year and 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 i'm very fortunate to, to be able to do that and get to be a part of it but you got to take care of yourself in the process um, but we're gonna we're gonna do everything we can to get Coach DeBoer and his staff and the kids ready to go. They're, the 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 workouts have been great. I get to watch them right outside my office window. A lot of great energy, um, and uh, you know, obviously, we're gonna have soccer getting ready to go. We're gonna have volleyball getting ready to go. Uh, we'll have cross country up and running, uh, no pun intended. And uh, you know, th- and then obviously we'll be right around the corner, and we got all of our winter sports and spring sports going too. And a lot of our spring sports compete in the fall as well with their fall season. So. It's exciting to see him and out there uh, representing our incredible university and uh, doing such a good job for for you know developing who they are as as students as people and uh, we got to make sure we do that. It's going to be interesting to watch how the NIL landscape changes here um, with the house litigation and see where things come down and and we'll be patient and thoughtful as we go through it. One of the things we learned I learned especially through COVID. All right. Um, we didn't rush to decisions. We were very thoughtful. We took our time. Greg Sankey, our presidents, I think the other ADs did a really good job when there was a lot of pressure to take a certain step. We didn't have to make those decisions yet. And we and we were patient. And we knew early on, and we, and we took COVID seriously, right? We knew early on the right thing for our kids were to go compete and do it as safely as we could and take steps and all that, whatever, whatever those were. And we had one of the best years we've ever had competitively. And so as we go through the new world of the house litigation and the settlement that's gone along with that, we're going to have to make some decisions. We're going to have to make some challenging decisions. At the same time, too, we're going to be very thoughtful and be and be, and take our time to make the decisions so we can make the best decisions we possibly can so it positively impacts all of our student athletes, our coaches, our staff, our university, and our fan base in as, in as good a manner as we can, knowing that knowing that there's some choppy waters ahead. Well, we look forward to the next steps, and uh, congratulations on a great year for Alabama Athletics in 2023 and 2024. And we uh, loved having you in person today here at Brian Diddy Stadium. Uh, we look forward to visiting with you again, but thank you for all the time you've given us and all the answers you've given to the fans. It's great to see you. Uh, thank you again, Roll thank Tide. Thank you, Roll Tide. And, and I want to give a shout-out to you, Roger. You do a good job. I, I, I listen to you when I'm traveling, uh, whether it's calling baseball games or women's basketball games, filling in different roles at different times. I, you do a really good job, and we appreciate the way you represent our university. Thank you so much, Greg. Yeah. Roll Tide. Roll Tide.